everybody. So good to be with you today. Glad you showed up. Today, everybody, uh, according to the Christian church calendar, is Pentecost Sunday, y'all. And it's been a great one so far. What I want to actually do is disengage from the Gospel of Mark for today. And we don't normally do this, but really just sense God saying, yeah, I want, I want to focus on this. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Actually, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open there. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Uh, it's been a little bit since I've got myself in trouble on the Holy Spirit and I got bored, so I figured I'd do it again today, all right? So uh, it's gonna be a really good time, guys. I'm telling you, you need this. I'm telling you, we need this. Our church needs this. Your marriage needs this. Your family needs this. Your kids need this. Uh, our city needs this, what we're gonna get into today. Now, let me give you some context on Acts chapter two. Jesus lives the perfect life that you and I couldn't. He dies the death that you and I deserve because of our own sin. He rises to new life three days later, putting out Satan's sin, death, hell, so you you could be redeemed, brought back in right relationship with God through repentance and faith in him. But the gospel story doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop at the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus ascends to heaven and we get to the first Pentecost Sunday in Acts chapter two, where the spirit is poured out and the church is really born. Now, I wanna start here because this is really important. Uh, we often forget this in church world. I wanna give you the context of Acts chapter two. This this is Jesus had uh, appeared to his disciples and he's saying, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait in the city for the coming of the Holy Spirit. We get down to verse 14 in Acts 1. This isn't in your notes, but it says this. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. The women, let's be real, they were probably holding down the fort on the prayer meeting like they have ever since. Ladies, can I get an amen from you? All right, that's just the reality. The dudes are just trying to keep up. All right, that's what's going on here in Acts chapter one. But this is what's really critical, guys, is the church is born in the context of a prayer meeting. Do you see that? That's the context. They were devoting themselves to prayer. They were going after God's presence together. That's the context of Acts two, chapter one, uh, chapter two, verses one through four, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What am I trying to say? So often, y'all, in church world, we fall into these weird ideas of strategy and mission vision. All of that's really great and important, but we just get busy in church life. We get 50 different committees and 50 different boards, and stuff gets confusing. This, was, this didn't happen at somebody's preaching, guys. That's what I'm trying to say. The church was not born because Peter gave up and gave a really uh, good sermon. Uh, as much as I I love sermons. He didn't get up and, and, and say, okay, here, we're going to get our theology on everything straightened out. This was a group of people that were in process. They were at the end of themselves. They heard Jesus say, just get in the upper room, wait and pray. And I'm about to do something incredible. These are people in process, just like you and me. And that is the context of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I love what Jesus says in Matthew 21. My house shall be called a house of prayer. It doesn't say a house of programs or preaching or music. All that's great. We do all of that stuff here because it's super important. But he says, you want to know what my people are going to look like? Uh, my gathered body of believers, it's going to look like a house of prayer. And this is why we have given ourselves to this vision of becoming a house of prayer, because as the church prays, God moves. Amen. I've heard it said one time that when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. And if you haven't realized, it's way better to be in that second category. And in the book of Acts, what we see, guys, is where there's a lot of prayer, there is much activity of the Holy Spirit. And when there is much activity of the Holy Spirit, you can bring it all the way back to a prayer meeting. So let's go ahead and jump in our, our verses here. This is Acts chapter 2. It says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The church was unified. They were together. They were in an upper room. They were in a house and uh, the Holy Spirit is attracted to that same level of unity as well. You want to quench the Spirit, bring division into the church. You want to hinder the work of the Spirit, bring discouragement and division into the body of Christ, into the world around you. He is very much attracted to unity. It says this in verse two, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. This is the Holy Spirit's grand entrance and divided tongues as of fire. This is where this gets a little bit weird for you and I, we'll talk about it, it's really good, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Look at this, and they were all, everybody say all. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen from somebody, all right? 
Everybody in the upper room, everybody got it. It says they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That really is the first point that I wanna make to you today. Notice the Holy Spirit came upon the entire new community, that there wasn't anybody that was left out. What I'm trying to say to you today, friend, is that the Holy Spirit is not reserved for some upper echelon spiritual elite in the Christian faith. This is for every believer. This is for men. This is for women. This is for young and old. This is for children. In fact, the apostle Peter gets up just a couple verses down the road, and he says this to the gathered assembly at this point, that the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and for your kids, for your children, for your sons and your daughters, and to all, any who, who God would call to himself. Anybody believe in God for the outpouring of spirit on your children? I'm telling you, this is what we need. Guys, the gravitational pull towards secularism is so strong. The only thing that's stronger that's gonna keep your kids anchored in Jesus is the Holy Spirit. This is my hope for my kids. And here's the good news. The promise is for me, for my wife, but also for my kids, guys. And here's the thing. Did you know that it is a promise? Jesus has promised you as a follower of Jesus, the infilling, animating baptism of the Spirit of God. God, that this is how the Christian life is meant to function. In fact, another verse that's not in your notes here in Acts chapter one, this is Jesus uh, speaking to the disciples in verse five, and he says this, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized, immersed in, filled with, saturated by the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. You know what that is? That's a promise. If you're taking notes, write it down. It's a promise. This is a guarantee. This is not something that Jesus uh, is, it's, uh, he's up in the air about. This is a promise for every new covenant believer in Jesus, that you would be filled with the very spirit of God. Now, uh, God. now let, me, let, me, let me get uh, in, into the weeds of this a little bit. Why this is really important is because within Western Christianity, we're really uncomfortable with the idea of the Holy Spirit. You just read that, many of you, the hair on the back of your head was standing up and you're just like, what is going on here? You know, like, I hope he doesn't, I hope he doesn't take this where I think he's gonna take it. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, we're going a little bit farther than you think I'm gonna take it today. So you buckle up and I hope you ate your Wheaties this morning. But here's, here's, here's the thing, right? We, Jesus is like, this, this is core to the Christian faith. And what we've done is because we're uncomfortable with this idea of the Holy Spirit is in evangelicalism in the Western world, what we've tended to do is we've redefined the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Bible. And you know what I'm talking about, right? And here's the thing, let me say this, you know I'm a Bible guy, you know I love the Bible, I preach the Bible, I saturate my life in this text. But here's, here's the thing, guys, this book, apart from the empowerment uh, of the Holy Spirit in your life is gonna stay locked up. It's not gonna have power to transform and reorient your heart, your soul, and your desires. This is where the apostle Paul says, knowledge builds up, but love edifies. You wanna know how to get positioned to have this book get in you and change everything about your life? It's you get filled with the spirit and you learn to hear from him as teacher to guide you into all truth, just like Jesus said he was gonna do. In John chapter 14 through 16, this is what he has come to do in your life and in my life. This is a promise. This is a guarantee. And this is why, everybody, let me say this. The church isn't winning in family and marriage and culture right now is because we have unhitched ourselves from the power of the Spirit. And so many of you, right, here's the thing. Let's just recognize all the baggage in the room that we have because everybody comes to this conversation, if you're a believer and you've been a Christian for any length of time, with all sorts of uh, cultural Christian backgrounds. Some of you, maybe you grew up in a church that just talked down on this stuff and all of a sudden all the spiritual gifts are just demonic. If you speak in tongues, it's a demon and you're demon possessed and, 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 and you know, whatever. It's just talked down uh, upon. Maybe you grew up in a Christian tradition where it just wasn't talked about. It wasn't talked down upon. It just wasn't talked about. You grew up in an environment like the church uh, in Acts chapter 19. Fascinating text where you have a group of believers. These are disciples. They had been water baptized. The apostle Paul shows up and he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And their response is this, 
what are you talking about, bro? Like we, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 19, verse two, you can check it out. Maybe that's your context. You're just like, I don't even know what to do with the Holy Spirit. I, I, maybe I've heard of him. I, I don't have a good vision of it. I haven't even really heard about this baptism of the Holy Spirit stuff. Uh, or maybe you grew, grew up white, hot, flaming Pentecostal. And you know, every, it was a bad Sunday if the church service didn't go for four hours. You know what I mean? Like, like wherever you're at, we all have some stuff that we bring to the table here. And what I wanna say is uh, right off the bat, one of the most neglected areas of theology in the church of the West is this area of pneumatology. There's your $5 theology word for today. Everybody say pneumatology. Now you sound super smart. It means study of the spirit. And this is what we are going to get into uh, today because guys, hear me from my heart. This is where the power is in the Christian life. If you are bored and your Christianity is not working for you, it's not changing, reorienting heart and desires, bringing greater freedom in the context of your soul, it's because you have disconnected yourself from God's power via the spirit. Let me illustrate it like this. My wife and I, when we bought our first house, it was a complete disaster. It was so bad. Uh, in Ferndale, it was a stucco house, no eaves. Everything in the walls was rotted. Uh, the front of the house was 10 inches higher than the back. We had, the foundation was completely screwed up. I cannot believe the people in our life let us buy this thing, is what I'm trying to say. Like, how horrible. Moms, dads, you know, people here at New Song, like, yeah, go for it. I think it'll work out. We had an addition on the back that was literally pulling off of the house. You'd be in the laundry room looking down like, oh, that's dirt right there in my house. You know, like that's a plant growing up from the ground in our laundry room. That probably shouldn't be there. Our, our washer and dryer were like 40 degrees tilted to the side. It was epic. And we had to, when we brought Asher home five years ago, we were in this house. Uh, when we put him in the stroller in the front of the house going for a walk or whatever, we had to lock the wheels so he didn't roll into the kitchen and break his face on the cabinets. Okay, that's this house. Now, uh, I, you know, I, I'm a young guy, 20, 23, 24 at the time, and, and we got a brand new dishwasher. And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm a homeowner now. I'm a man, and I'm gonna install this thing myself. And worst moment of my life, bad, worst decision of my life. And so I had to do some rewiring under the sinks, basically what I had to do. Uh, because for some reason they put a bunch of exposed electrical wires underneath the kitchen sink, <laughs> by the way. And so I'm under there. I'm like, no, I can do this. We're going to put a splitter thing in here and then a wire in the dishwasher. It's going to be great, guys. Worst decision of my life. Basically just lost power to the entire kitchen. And uh, I'm trying to figure out like, what the heck is going on? This should not be that difficult. I'm messing around, trying a bunch of stuff. And minutes turn to hours, turn to days, turn to years of no power in the kitchen. It wasn't here. So ultimately, my wife came to me and she's like, okay, babe, I, I think time's up. I think you need to call somebody. Now, la ladies, let me just say this. You want to assault the masculinity of a man? You come at him with, I think you need to call somebody. All right. So just, I was like, uh, oh, dang it. You're, you're probably right. So I call a guy, he comes out to our house. And of course it was a dude that was younger than I was that went to school with me that we graduate, I graduated with. And uh, he was like, oh yeah, hey man, how you doing? And, and then I'm like, good. Uh, so what brings you over here? <laughs> you know, uh, okay, kitchen. Yeah, that's right. Got him under there. And he's like, oh yeah, no problem. Get out of here in five minutes. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I, I could have done it too. Yeah, I just decided to, you know. Job security for you. And so he, he did it and just went bang, 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 did the thing. I don't know what he did. And then boom, power's back on, right? And here's what I'm trying to say, y'all. For some of you, your wires are crossed because you have a bad theology around the Holy Spirit. And this is what God wants to do today. He wants to bring the lights on. He wants to say, this is what you need. And let me just say this to you, friends. This is what you need in life. I'm telling you today that your marriage does not need to stay untenable because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Your family does not have to stay broken because of the power of the Holy Spirit. You do not have to stay addicted to pornography because of the power of the Holy Spirit or whatever you're using to self-medicate yourself with in regard to the pain and the difficulty of life so that you can just get up out of bed and function in the world in sort of any, any realm of happiness. Whatever that thing is for you, alcohol, drugs, porn, guys, girls, social media, whatever it is, 
You don't have to live in this obsessive reality of going after those horizontal lesser than pleasures because the power of God is what you're looking for. And he is in church today, still in 2023, here at New Song Church in Bellingham, Washington, ready to break some chains off of your life. This is what he's willing to do. And the question is, are you gonna let him in? That's the question. That's the ultimate question. The question is not, is it God's will to fill me with the spirit and give me spiritual power? The question is, what's keeping it from happening in your life? And more often than not, what I've found in the church is it's unbelief. We're like Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, says that he couldn't do many mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. This is God's good design and will for your life that you would be filled with power. In fact, look at this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. This is what Paul the Apostle says to a, a young pastor, Timothy. He says this. It's true for all of us here as followers of Jesus as well. He says this, you have not been given a spirit of fear. Everybody say this with me. I have not been given a spirit of fear. I have not been given a spirit of fear. You have not been given a spirit of fear. But Paul says, but power and of love, and a sound mind. Now, I would ask you, what defines your life more right now? Fear or power? Fear or love? Fear or a sound mind? Because here's the thing. For many of us, you, you open up the shades to your house and you got 50 different reasons to be afraid of stuff right now, to live in fear, uh, right? Like that's just the reality of our, our current situation in life right now. Like there's, there are so many different reasons to be afraid. For some of you, it's not what's happening globally, economically, it's relationally, personally. There are so many different reasons that life is going to continue to give you to be afraid. But here's what I wanna tell you. You have not been given a spirit of fear. You haven't. And and, and here's what fear is going to do if you allow it to be your disciple maker, because many people do. We submit to fear in a way that we say, you are our rabbi, you are our teacher, come and shape us into being a certain kind of person in the world. This is how many of us live. That's not conscious, that's subconscious. That's what happens when you submit to fear. You're saying, fear, you are my teacher, you come and make me into becoming a different kind of person. And it's going to make you into being three different types of, uh, uh, three different things. Let me break it down this way. Fear what fear does, obsessive fear, is it turns you, number one, into a false prophet. You're always looking to the future, saying, sky's falling, this isn't gonna end well, you know, and let me just say this about this guy, you were a nightmare in 2020 for me as a pastor, okay? Like, literally, you know, like, we had, we had people just say, like, listen, this is the end of the world, the government's coming, and I hope you stocked up on guns, all right? It's like, that's this guy. Some of you are like, hey, I married him, and I'm, I'm glad you're here uh, at, at church today. If I, right? You're always looking to the future, and it's always doom and despair. It's always, this is what's going to go wrong. You're prophesying. You're a false prophet. You're more focused on Satan's ministry in the world than Jesus's ministry in the world, right? That's the point. You're foretelling the worst case scenario all of the time, and and never living in faith of, no, this is what God can do, right? This is what God can do. It makes you a false prophet that is always focused on what can go wrong instead of what Jesus can do right. Number two, what fear does is it makes you a false worshiper. What I mean by this is fear for many of us becomes obsessive and paralyzing. I've experienced this in life. I'm sure you have as well. When you're deeply fearful of something, it becomes paralyzing. It's all you can focus on. You can't break your attention from it. It's there in the morning when you wake up. It's there with you throughout the day. It's there uh, in the evening as you lay back in bed to go to sleep. It is your constant friend and companion in life. And by the way, you need a breakup because it's a bad one. Okay. So this turns you into a false worshiper. You want to know how to tell what your idol is in life, by the way. It's the thing by which you say of it, if I lose this, my life is over so afraid of losing this, whatever it is, relationship, amount of money, not achieving this vision dream for the future that I have, whatever it is, not getting something, getting not something and then it not being enough. What, what is it? What, that's how you tell what your idol is. It's the thing that makes you lose your mind over if it's threatened. Fear is gonna make you a false worshiper. 
The Bible calls this idolatry, saying, no, don't focus on Jesus. Worship Jesus. Don't give your mind and your attention on everything that can go wrong in life. Don't live in a spirit of fear, but live in a spirit of faith, a spirit of victory, and this is your inheritance in Jesus. Number three, the third thing that fear is gonna make you into being is a false believer. Now, I don't mean false believer in the sense of an apostate, that you have lost your faith, disqualified from grace. That's not what I mean here at all. In fact, the first skeptics and unbelievers of Christianity were Jesus's own disciples, and they ended up going on to change the world. So just because you struggle with faith, it doesn't mean that you uh, have lost your faith. But what fear does is it is misplaced faith. That's what fear is. It's I have more faith in what Satan can do in the world. I have more faith in what can go wrong than in what God can do and what can go right. It turns you into a false believer. You're not actually believing rightly. Now, here's what Paul says. You, you haven't been given a spirit of fear. You don't have to live in fear anymore because you have been given a spirit of, help me now, power and love and a sound mind. This is your inheritance. Guys, it's this idea he's getting at in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 of life transformation. Did you know that's God's vision for your life? You don't have to stay where you're at. Like you can become continually a different kind of person. By the way, this is the, what the whole promise of the new covenant is built around, is the spirit of God coming and dwelling you and changing you. Did you know that? Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 through 27. Look at this, this is great. One of the great uh, moments of God in the old covenant, speaking of what's to come through the new covenant reign of Jesus. And he says, this is what's gonna happen. This is what I'm gonna do. I I will, not you will, I will, says God, says Yahweh, says Jehovah, says the creator. I will. This isn't about you. This is about what God is sovereignly going to accomplish and do on your behalf. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all of your idols, I will cleanse you. Verse 26. And I will, there it is again, give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will, there it is again, put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Question, who's the one doing all of the doing? Is it you or is it God? God is saying, this is, this is what I'm gonna do. This is the new covenant of grace. This is what I'm gonna accomplish in your life. You got a hard heart, I can do heart surgery. I got a new heart for you. You got a heart of stone, I'll give you a heart of flesh. You, you got a heart that's just bent towards rebellion, don't wanna please God, don't wanna worship God, don't wanna live in a way that's pleasing to him. I'll do something about that. And oh, by the way, it's not about behavior modification. This isn't about you putting boundaries around your behavior and tweaking behavior. This is no, this is nature regeneration. You get a new heart. You become a new kind of person when the spirit of God possesses you uh, on the other side of your faith in Jesus. This is the victory, guys, that you and I can connect ourselves to and live into via the Holy Spirit. And this is the beauty, again, of Christianity. This is God's vision. It's transformation for your life. This is not become a better person. This is get filled with the spirit and become an altogether different person. Uh, I'll give you my story. Uh, when, when I was 19 years old, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it was a wild and crazy moment. Didn't really have a grid for it. Didn't really know what was going on. I was at a Russian youth prayer meeting. And uh, uh, let, let, me, let me just say this. I love the Russian church. I am terrified of the Russian church. <laughs> All right, like here's the, like, like you go to a Russian youth prayer meeting, it's questionable if you come out alive. That's what I'm trying to say. I had no idea what I'm walking into. I get there, some buddies were there and everybody just starts praying. They're super loud. People are like, like there's prophecy happening. I'm hearing tongues for like the first time in my life. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not Russian and that definitely is not English. And I'm like, what the heck is going on right now? And, and, and I just sense Holy Spirit just speak to me and say, I wanna do something in your life. I wanna do something in your life. You're gonna crack the gate and let me do it. And so what I had to do is I had to go, I had to get out of my spiritual pride and arrogance because I'm there like looking down like, oh, don't you know nobody speaks in tongues today? You know, I have to, I, I, like God was challenging me. He was like, I, like, what if? 
right? Like, like, do you want to stop taking a blowtorch to the Bible and doing scriptural origami and trying to make it say what it doesn't actually clearly say? And would you open yourself up to what I want to do in your life? So I was like, okay, Jesus, here I am. Come and do whatever you want. The, the youth pastor comes up to me, lays hands on me. This is by far the paradigmatic uh, posture and pattern of the New Testament. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? You get hands laid on you and, and people who have received the Holy Spirit pray for you and you experience the infilling of the Spirit. That's how it happens. This is what happened to me. The guy prays for me. All of a sudden, my body, I start con- like shaking. I have no idea what's going on. I'm being filled with this sense of the love of God. It's this incredible moment where this is clearly something is happening happening and there's no way that I could actually fabricate this experience. Now, from there, my life, guys, because here's the thing, it's not about the encounter, it's about what happens afterwards. This is going to save you from getting really weird in life. I know a lot of people who hyper-obsess about, I just got to, oh God, I just need an encounter with you. You know, just live for it. I'm living for the mountaintop, living for these incredible moments when, you know, it's heaven split and I saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand. You know, like, that doesn't really happen that often, okay? But here's the thing. When you live hyper-focused on it, it never comes because God can't trust you. Because then what happens in the in-between is you're always looking for that moment to come instead of receiving and walking by faith that God loves me. He's for me. Heavens could split. God could speak audibly to me and tell me how much. But here's the thing. I don't need that to happen because I've got the scriptures. I've got God's word and my faith is anchored there. And I get to live in such a way because of the truth of what this book says, because I walk by faith, not by feelings that he really does love me. Like he says he does. If the supernatural stuff comes, great. That's awesome. I'm all for it. The real question is when it does, What happens afterwards? Let me tell you what happened afterwards in my life. Everything about my life changed. 10 year porn addiction broken off in a moment. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to watch porn. I was like, what the frick was I doing with my life? What a stupid kid. Like, what are you doing? You're wasting your life on a freaking computer looking at goofy stuff. Like, you're a joke. It was, I, I was like, I, I couldn't even, I just felt like a completely different person. I, 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 all of the fear of rejection that I carried and, and you know, like, am I ever going to find love that every 19 year old experience is just boom, broken off of me. It's all gone. All of a sudden, I didn't want to go to, uh, you know, Western and be in the dorms with my buddies and get wasted every weekend. I just, I didn't want to do that anymore. My desires completely changed. Guys, this is the beauty of Christianity. When it's rightly experienced in your life, it doesn't go after what you do, but what you want to do. That's what changes. And then what you do changes. You can't get the want to do to change purely by focusing on stuff. You need a renovation of the heart in the language of Dallas Willard. This is what actually needs to have it. I became a completely different person after that. So much so that in the coming weeks and months after that, I entered into a season where it was all I wanted to do, me and my friends, uh, we would sit at Woods Coffee and read our Bibles for eight to 10 hours a day. A day. That is not an exaggeration. And, and my question for you is what has to happen in the life of a 19 year old kid to have that kind of a desire to just sit and read the Bible? Let me tell you something real something transcendent, something powerful. That's what has to actually happen. Jonathan Edwards, uh, famous, incredible theologian, one of the greatest minds that uh, our nation has ever produced. He uh, was a pastor, theologian, thinker in the 1700s, used mightily of God in the first great awakening, saw just myriads of people come to faith in Jesus. He was actually a Puritan preacher, so he was about as conservative as they can be. He's the kind of guy that would get up and preach with a wig and a robe, okay? So can you imagine me getting up here with a wig and a robe? Like that, nothing to me speaks conservative, anti-sensationalist, anti-emotionalist Christianity. Then you got a dude in a Puritan pulpit preaching in a wig and a robe. But he would get up and all of a sudden he would preach and God began to really move move in his church, in his community, and people would have encounters with God's power in such a way where, you know, church history write about this and say that they would be laid out in the church building uh, for, they couldn't get up. Like church service is done and the altar's full and people are just like, I'm stuck. I can't move because I am caught up in visions of the glory of God. And by the way, Acts chapter two, Joel two talks about this, that your sons and your daughters will dream dreams and you will see visions. That is a promise of the 
the scriptures. This isn't anti-Bible. You just don't want to see it in your Bible, okay? I'm gonna leave that there for you to deal with. Okay, but he, was, he, he would have these experiences in his church. People would just be stuck on the floor, and so much so that they would leave. Everybody's like leaving, and, and, and they'd come back the next day, and janitors are trying to clean up, and there's the dude still stuck on the ground like, hey man, I need you to move. I got a mop, you know? Like, can you go away? And, and, and they'd just be, they would be stuck in this moment of this supernatural encounter with the Holy Spirit. He, of course, became under, came under a lot of heat from uh, his fellow Puritan preachers and pastors. They're coming at him with all sorts of stuff. This is emotionalism. This is sensationalism. Very good to be on guard against, by the way. This is fanatical Christian uh, experience that's purely rooted in human psychology. And how are you allowing this to happen in your church? His response, so beautiful, bears witness today. Here's what Jonathan Edwards says. I don't care if you fall down. I care what happens when you get back up. Fall down. Like, I, don't, I don't care. Like I, I'm gonna be open to what the Spirit of God might wanna do, right? And let me say this. If you get too crazy, I will personally put my hand around you and we'll have a come to Jesus moment talk about why you're distracting everybody else, okay? So we're not gonna overcorrect you. But here's, here's the thing. He's like, I don't care if you fall down. I care what happens when you get back up. In other words, the fruit of a genuine encounter with the Spirit of God, it's not like something crazy happens and you're, you know, it's that you walk out different. All right, that you become a different kind of person. And this is the power of the Spirit in operation in your life. People have issues with this, and I get it. I understand it. Good to be on guard against, but do not quench the Spirit with your religious boundary lines that are not in the Bible. That's what I'm trying to say. We gotta be careful that we walk that line uh, well with Jesus. Now, here's the thing. The disciples modeled this for us. You guys remember Peter, like, like all of the disciples, what happened in their life? They went from cowards to courageous. Peter denied Jesus three times. Total coward. Total like, got schooled by a, a little schoolgirl, basically. Hey, I saw you with Jesus. No, I wasn't there. You know, just denies Jesus three times. And, and, and then what happens is he ends up dying by crucifixion because of his faith in Jesus. In Acts chapter two, the same Jesus who he said, I don't know him, he gets up in front of thousands of people in his hometown and he says, no, Jesus is the Messiah. You need to repent of your sin and give your life to him and receive the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people get saved because of his witness uh, for Jesus. He went from coward to courageous. Paul the apostle, same thing, person security of the church to a proclaimer of Christian truth and reality, wrote two thirds of the New Testament. What happened in the middle for both of those guys? It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was Acts chapter two for Peter. He went from coward filled with the spirit to courageous witness to the world around him. Paul the apostle, persecutor of the church, he appears, Jesus appears to him, falls off the horse, goes blind, disciple comes, lays hands on him, he sees again, and he receives the Holy Spirit. Now he goes immediately preaching that same Jesus who he was just persecuting. You've got entire cities, guys, in the book of Acts that are hostile to Christianity with all of these occult pagan practices and, and being completely, radically transformed because there's people inside of them that are filled with the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, that's what Bellingham needs. You wanna know how we're gonna reach the city, how we're gonna reach the Northwest? The people of God are gonna come into our inheritance of the Spirit of God. That's when everything changes. Now, here's, let, me, let me just say this. I'm gonna wrap this up with a few more thoughts here. You need this for you. That's the whole first chunk of my message, all right? This, you need this for you. This is for every believer. Uh, this is God's heart designed for you. By the way, Paul says in Ephesians, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, that this isn't a one-time thing. This is a, you and I get to drink from the river of God's consistent filling, empowering, emboldening, uh, 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 hope-filling, love-filling spirit every single day. That's your inheritance. You, you need this for you, but also we need this for Christian mission. This is, this is when the church explodes uh, in, in the region that they're surrounded by. That's on the other side of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's this question uh, that people often ask of, should Christians embrace the weird? Should we embrace, there's some, can we be real? There's some weird stuff. 
Like, I mean, tongues of fire speaking in unknown languages, uh, dead guy's body and blood. Like there, there's some weird stuff. Dead guy got up, flew off to heaven, uh, like Superman disappeared. And, and, and you know, like, like you, you believe, so there's the question of, should we embrace the weird stuff? And, and here's this really fascinating interview that I found. Uh, Tom Holland, who wrote an incredible book, called Dominion. He's not a Christian uh, yet, but he wrote this book tracing basically Christianity's uh, influence on the Western world over the last couple thousand years. It's thick, it's fat, it is beefy, it's a great read. And basically his whole thing is, listen, everything that you have in the West, Christianity gave it to you, you're welcome. And, and he talks about this idea that the challenge for churches today is this, that essentially we've won. That everything that was once weird and strange and bizarre to the Romans, now it's accepted and it's normalized. Where everything uh, in church history, what have we done? We've provided orphanages and education and poverty relief and hospitals. All of that now, it's normal and it's actually uh, provided by the state, right? And so Tom Holland, he comes with this fascinating perspective, I thought, where he's like, no, you want to know what the church needs to do? You got to embrace the weird stuff. He says, you got to embrace the stuff that you're not getting from the Department of Health. Right, the, the, the angels and the demons and the spiritual realm and the baptism of the spirit, the book of Job. You know, it talks about the problem of evil. Christianity's answer to it. The spiritual answers to life's questions. He's like, you want to see the church uh, have a resurgence in the Western world? You got to get back to the weird, being distinct, being weird again. And here's the thing, guys, what I've found so often when it comes to God's power, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the stuff that we're talking about, it's not culture that has a problem with it. It's Christians. It's the church. It's not culture, it's the church. And, and, and talk about demonic strategy, right? That if this is God's power source for us, this is what's gonna make us a different kind of people and give empower us to uh, witness to the world around us. I mean, talk about demonic strategy to break us uh, off of a connection via the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is what Tom Holland is like. You, you gotta get back to the weird stuff. And we're seeing a tectonic shift, guys, in the Western world right now uh, in, in regard to public opinion regarding Christianity, faith in God. We've got all these influencers all over the place. You know, you got Joe Rogan. In fact, I saw this clip. This was great. You have Joe Rogan a couple years ago. He's like super passionate, red in the face. And he's like, the New Testament is utter horse expletive. And I'm already in trouble with religious people, so I'm not gonna say it. But he's like, it's, it's horse crap. It's bull crap. The New Testament, throw it in the garbage, get out, get rid of it. It's ridiculous. Now, fast forward to recently, this recent interview you did, just stitch it right on. He's up there like, yeah, you know what? Uh, you know, the core teachings of Christianity, the New Testament, uh, really good stuff. And, and you, should, you should read it and do, do that because it's gonna be really good for you. It's like, bro, that was some serious backpedaling right there, what you just did. But this is, this is our cultural moment. You got Jordan Peterson, his lecture on the Bible, 2017, uh, just incredible influence grew out of that. His whole thesis meant everything that we've got in the West, Christianity gave it to you. We should probably not chuck this whole thing and reconsider what we may have missed. You got uh, uh, people all over the place. I mean, it would fail me to have enough time to talk about Dave Rubin, other influencers in our cultural moment that are saying, listen, we have to reconsider this stuff because it's actually given us everything that we hold dear today. We have a culture that's flowering to Christianity Christian morality, flowering to Christian ethics. Again, it really is happening. And at the same time, opening up to the reality of the spirit. We are now post-Christian, post-enlightenment thinkers, which means that there is a reopening up to the spiritual realm. We're like, yeah, I think there's something there, right? Uh, you got guys like Rain Wilson, uh, who's Dwight Schrute, by the way, if uh, you've been living under a rock, shame on you. You didn't know who that was, all right? Here's what we're talking about. He was doing this interview. I was listening to him. And uh, he's been on this really fascinating spiritual journey. He's like, here's what I realized. I am not a human being looking for a spiritual experience. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. That is the mantra of a 21st century Western world right now, that I am spiritual, but I am not religious. Now, here's what Jesus is going to come around and say. You need to be very, very, very careful that your spirituality is not rooted in my spirit and my, uh, in, in the book, the Bible, right? Because otherwise you're going to open yourself to all sorts of demonic counterfeits that are not real, right? That's the, there's something on the inside of you that longs for the transcendent, that's looking for 
power that's looking for spiritual reality. And here Jesus is gonna come around. He's gonna affirm that. He's gonna be like, yes. And he's also gonna critique you and say, listen, you don't get to be like the modern syncretistic thinker who just basically pulls all these different pieces of these different worldview and puts it into this weird like smelting pot and you end up with this weird like esoteric spiritual experience where you're doing your yoga and your sun salutations every morning. By the way, I still have PTSD from Tony Horton yelling at me P90X yoga in high school when I was doing it. Anybody else with me on that? He's like, do the vinyasa and hold it. You know, it's just terrifying. But you, got your, you do your yoga, you do your meditation practices, you got all of your freaking teas and essential oils, right? You do all of the stuff, spiritual practices. And, and Jesus is like, what are you doing? You are looking for transcendent encounters with true power. And I'm telling you, it's only found in me. In fact, what's fascinating in Acts chapter 19, look at this. This is incredible. Uh, you've got a city here that is full of all sorts of pagan idolatry, all sorts of craziness. If we could get Acts chapter 19, that text in there up. Uh, they're, they're, they've got all these occult practices. They're using crystals and spell books and tarot cards and uh, you know psychic mediums and all sorts of craziness is going on in the city. Sound familiar? <laughs> That's like our backyard, all right? Turned around, been around for a long time. Look at this. This is the effect of the spirit of God coming through the people of God in proclamation of the gospel of God. This is the effect on the city. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging, getting rid of it. This is useless now. This is stupid. This is less than, this is a counterfeit. Divulging their practices. Next slide. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together. Look at this, I love this. And burned them in the sight of everybody. They're like, yeah, we're gonna have a bonfire. What are you burning? Uh, all of our stupid pagan stuff that doesn't work. Yeah, because we found something in someone that does. And his name is Jesus. They burned it in the sight of all and they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Depending on your metrics of, you know, like currency transfer then to now, probably something about nine to $11 million worth of material was burned here. So the question is, what happened, guys? It's you have a people similar to, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious, I'm looking for spiritual experience. And what happened is they encountered the power of Jesus. They encountered the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead in such a way that they are divulging their pagan practices and they're like, this is a counterfeit. This is, all, this is stupid, right? Like this is, I was black and white, now I'm full HD color IMAX, right? Like this is, this is what I was looking for all along. It wasn't hard for them. It wasn't difficult for them. And I'm telling you, this is what God wants to do in your life. This is on offer. That type of transformation that would make a witch and a warlock go from pagan occult practices to full-fledged worshiper of Jesus, proclaimer of Christian truth and reality and the gospel is available in this room. The same power that would take Peter as a coward and make him courageous, the same power that would take a Paul the Apostle who's anti-Christ, anti-church, about as anti-Christianity as you can possibly possibly get and flip his life around in such a way that he ends up writing most of the New Testament, the same kind of power that I've experienced, that many people in this room have experienced that has brought deep healing and transformation to, your, to our lives is available for you right now via the Holy Spirit. How many know he's still alive? Still here, didn't go anywhere. He's present. He always stays the same. He never changes. Worship team, go ahead and come on up. Communion team, go ahead and come on up. I wanna do one more thing here because there's something happening under the surface uh, that I don't want to miss out on. I wanna connect everything I'm talking about with the greater story of the Bible for you because this, is, this has been uh, an, an in-process thing for a very long time in the scriptures up until this point. There's a fascinating moment in uh, John chapter 20 where Jesus, he beats death, rises from the dead, and he appears to his disciples for the first time, and he says, he breathed on them. And so I hope you brush, brush your teeth, Jesus. I mean, like, dead in the ground for three days, probably pretty nasty. He breathed on them and said to them, look at what he said. What did he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. First, it's like, what is going on here? But how many know uh, there's always so much depth to God's word? Let me show you what's going on here. When was the last time that God breathed on man?
And God knelt down in the dirt, breathed into it, and out came a man, Adam. And the human family was born. What did Adam do? God spoke to Adam and uh, he was like, hey, Adam, I want you to obey me about the tree. This is what he said. This was Adam's charge. Obey me about the tree. Do not eat the tree of not the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam's disobedience in the garden of life, what did it do? It meant death for humanity. Now Jesus comes along to rewrite, rescript, fix, restore, and renew everything that the first Adam had destroyed. God says the same thing to Jesus, the last Adam, as he did the first Adam. What does he say? Jesus, obey me about the tree. Only Jesus' tree was a wooden cross. And Jesus, through his obedience to the Father regarding the cross in death, now it means life for humanity. What's going on in Acts chapter two, guys? This is the inbreaking of the new creation right here. This is the new humanity coming into existence. What am I trying to say? There is power here because Jesus is alive to make you a new creation. Just as my pastor always used to say, there is hope for tomorrow because there is forgiveness for your past. That the blood has been shed. His body has been broken. Jesus was obedient to the Father about the tree. And so now you can become a new creation. You can be forgiven. You can be restored. I'm telling you, whatever you walked in here with, it does not disqualify you from the grace of God. So would you stand with me? I wanna pray for us to that end, that this would be a moment of you connecting uh, with that as we take communion. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you are the giver of the spirit. You say in John 7, come to me all who are thirsty and I'll satisfy you. Cause a well of living water to rise up in you unto eternal life. You said this about the Holy Spirit. You do the same thing. Lord Jesus, just as your side was pierced and blood and water poured out, you've promised to send water to the hard, the fallow, the dry ground. Bring streams up in the desert. Our souls, our brokenness, our sin, our pain, our woundedness, our hurt, our hangups. Holy Spirit, we just come before you now on this Pentecost Sunday and we pray for a release of your power here. Jesus, just as you tell us that the Father is gonna give the Spirit to those who ask, God, I pray for my church family today that we would be a people saturated by, filled by, baptized in and with the Holy Spirit, not by anything that we do or because we're good enough, but because you're good. So it's our great joy to celebrate Lord, the price that you paid for our freedom and for the coming of the Holy Spirit through your life, your death, your broken body, your shed blood in Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, I'm gonna invite you forward.